Hi, thanks for joining us for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Starting seeds indoors has one big problem. Where do you get enough light? Today we're going to build a grow light. Also, you can find advice about anything online, but how do you make sure you're getting good gardening advice? That's just ahead on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Tom Mashore. Mr. Tom is a master gardener in Tipton County. Mm -hmm. And Carol Reese is here. Ms. Carol is an ornamental horticultural specialist for UT Extension. All right, so Mr. Tom, mm -hmm. you're gonna build a grow light for us today, right? Yeah, I kind of refer to it as a grow stand, okay. but yes, it's uh, cheap, inexpensive to make. I went to a big lot, uh, to a home improvement section mm -hmm. and, and priced all the things it makes to make it, and it was like $26. $3 for the wood, $12 for the light, and $10 for the bulbs, so. Hey, I like cheap. <laughs> me too. You know, so that, that works for me. And so. it's really easy to do. Uh, one of the reasons to have them is, like I said, for starting seeds, like Chris mentioned at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, if you got outdoor plants that you want to bring in, instead of putting them in the garage, you can put them under a grow stand so they get more light than they would in a garage. Mm -hmm. Most garages are really dark. Uh, and they're just something fun to do, it really is. Okay. Growing seeds, I just love growing seeds. I don't care about planting them, I just like growing them. Uh, do you have to be a pro, though, to be able to put one of these together? Absolutely not. On a scale of one to ten, where one is raking leaves, <laughs> uh, ten is building a greenhouse, okay. this comes in about one and a half. One and a half. Okay, mm -hmm. I think I can handle that, then. <laughs> and I said, it's really easy. Now, uh, we're going to use a two-by-four, untreated two-by-four. Okay. You don't want to bring anything treated in your house. Okay. Uh, the two-by-four by eight foot only requires two cuts. A first cut is going to be 50 inches long, and that's where the fluorescent light's gonna hang. Mm -hmm. It gives us an inch clearance on both sides of the four foot uh, fluorescent light. And then the remaining piece, you cut straight in half, which is 46 inches, so it'll make 23 inches uh, for each piece. And if you buy it at the home improvement center, most of them will cut the wood for you. Sure. Ah, that's good deal. So it's real easy. So for saving time, we got it already pre-cut right. and ready to assemble. Okay. So here's a 50 uh, inch piece. Uh, one of the things, the harder thing about it is measuring. <laughs> what you want to do when you get your fluorescent light is measure. You got it? There, you got it. Okay. Measure on the back side, the center, which is right about here. Measure from here to this little hole on this end. And it's going to be the same on this end. Once you got that, go for the center line of the 4x4 four and make the same measurements to find out where to put the two cup hooks, which is what's going to, the light's going to hang from. Good. Real easy. A lot of times it helps just to put a little nail in it and pull it out and use the nail as a starter. Okay, okay so we got our 50 inch piece. We got the two uh, cup hooks. Next thing we gotta do is take the two legs. Now the two legs right here, uh, I just pre-drilled them, but uh, they're going to go on the ends of this piece. Like so? Like that, okay. just like that. And Look also, that. before we do that, though, to make it a little bit easier, <laughs> you want to put some scrap wood down here at the bottom to keep it from tipping over. Okay. It makes it nice and easy. So this won't matter what it is, just some no, kind of scrap. Just, just, grab, just scrap wood. Okay. So you want to make it nice and level. Mm -hmm. And I need some screws. Oh, there are some yeah, screws. You need screws. <laughs> How about that? They're so conveniently located. How about that? Look like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> All right. All right. Electric drill does make it easy. Yeah, yeah, that works. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do the same thing to the other side. This is so much easier on the wrist. Okay, now we got those pieces. We got this. We got that. We're going to now screw it in. Okay, we want this scrap wood on the outside. Oh. So it won't interfere. Duh. Okay, you want to hold that up for Not me, sure please? Will. 
and I'm going to run over to the side. Mm -hmm. I feel it. Oh. Uh, I guess I ain't. Uh, let's turn this over this way towards me. Okay. Can you get it? Yeah, we got the way. I'll go ahead and got, the, got them started. Okay. You got it too? Yeah, I do. Good enough. Get that one. Yeah, yeah, that'll work. It'll hold it. There you go. All right. And we're going to do the same thing to the other end. Uh, you can use nails or screws. Okay. Now the stand is finished, except for the lights. I think so far I can handle that. I can do that. Yeah. Now, when you buy the fluorescent light fixture, it usually comes with two chains. Mm -hmm. Well, that big hole and little hole, that's where we're going to put it. We'll go this way. Okay. There you go. Okay, you want to hang it? I'll hold on to that one. All right, we'll do the same thing over here. There like that. Goes. And now yep. you just hook that to the cup, hook. cup hooks. And because we measured fairly well, <laughs> it should hang straight. I've got it. There we go. Now, a nice thing about the chains, you notice we got about an inch clearance on both sides, mm -hmm. is typically when you're starting seeds, you want the light three to four inches above the plants, uh, the seedlings. So what you do is just take your chain and you just raise it up on the cup okay. hooks. As it grows, so you just keep raising it. Just adjust it on up and down like that. Yeah, just okay. real easy. Gotcha. Now, uh, about the bulbs. When you buy a two-pack, there's typically cardboard ends on it that tells you uh, the size. This larger one is called a T12 size. And you've probably seen the smaller ones. Those are T8s. You're looking one with the highest luminance. In this mm. case, it's 2900. Uh, the higher the lunums, the brighter the bulb, the more light you're going to get. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go ahead and can you plug that in? Oh, so yeah. Yes. Sure folks that. All, All right. right. There we, we have light. light. We said that same time. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it. Just like for 26 bucks plus tax, mm -hmm. uh, you got yourself a little handy grow stand. Now, a couple of accessories I recommend, not necessary, but one is those cheap. Uh, Shower curtain liners that are made out of uh, that are white, and you hang that over the top of it. And what that does for you is it reflects the light back to the plants from all sides. You end up with getting bushy plants. It uh, retains the heat generated by the fluorescent light. I have mine in the spare room, which we don't have the vent open, mm -hmm. so that gives us sufficient light. And because of the uh, humidity graded by the pine soil, it retains humidity. It makes for good, healthy plants. The only other recommend uh, recommended accessory is a timer. I set mine to 14 hours day, uh, 10 hours nighttime, which is typical of the summertime. Mm. And you don't have to worry about remembering to unplug it or plug it back right. in, it does it for you automatically. The digital one has a battery backup, so if the power is lost, when the power comes back, it knows exactly what time it is That's good. and keeps it at the same settings that you had it. Good thing. All right. Well, Mr. Tom, we appreciate that demonstration. Thank you. Thank now you. the folks can go out and build their own. Easy, easy, easy. I like easy. it. All right. Thank you much. All right, guys, so we're, uh, we're looking at the family plot compost pile over here, and we have uh, constructed it correctly in that there are two vessels so that we can rotate back and forth. Uh, the rotation is um, due to the influx from garden residue here has gotten a little bit screwed up, so some of this fresh stuff should be over here. Uh, well, you get the, the good cook down stuff on the bottom on that side. Um, Another thing, uh, the little microbes are friends in the soil. There are about seven billion of them in a cup of, of good, healthy soil. Uh, like a lot of edge um, in, in what they're chewing on. They'll break it down faster. So it might help to knock some of these big pieces down just a little bit, make smaller particles uh, so that they can get at it a little bit faster. Uh, and it's obvious that this could use a little bit 
uh, more engagement as there are trees growing out of it. So turning it and, and attending to it will give you a better, better product. Uh, other than that, uh, if you wanted to boost it, uh, I tell people all the time that coffee grounds are great because they're basically all edge and they'll get your, your critters going good and fast. All right, Ms. Carroll, you know, we always tell folks that they can go to the internet and find some of those answers to their gardening questions, but how do we know if those sites actually have good advice? Well, and, and I'd say the, maybe even the majority of them don't. Yeah. <laughs> so wow. a lot of times you just go to Google and type something in, and I, I'm not sure how that logarithm works, but yeah, things pop up that aren't necessarily good sources. Uh, I have a few kind of general rules, and first and foremost, if they're trying to sell you something, <laughs> Yeah. They may not be telling you the truth, they may not be telling you the whole truth, and even just omission a lot of times is the big crime. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm particularly suspicious of big box store sites <laughs> because they won't give you regional information about okay. plants. They're going to make them all selling, they're going to do well. As soon as the, the information is inaccurate, especially about size of plants mm -hmm. a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Plants are going to get bigger. I always tell people plant tags lie. Yeah. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't believe the plant tags. Um, so. When I, I, there are a few nurseries that I do trust, and, and, and uh, I don't know if that would be a good idea to mention those as far as specifics. But uh, one thing I've noticed uh, is online sources, sometimes when you even order the plants, they're not accurate. So one thing wow. I also look wow. for, if it's an online nursery, I don't know, does it get good information, but do I actually get the plant ordered? Okay. So, but as far as good information, um, yes, we do like for people to go to the university sites. Sure. I mean, we try to research all our information, mm -hmm. and so if it's a .edu site, but, but stuff doesn't disappear off the internet often <laughs> when it should, uh -huh. and things change, as mm -hmm. you and I know. Mm -hmm. New diseases come down the pipe, new pests, so a plant that we once considered very durable is no longer. So we have to be sure we stay current. And uh, sometimes, I, I always tell people this, I'm gonna mention several good sites. Okay. But I like to go to several sites to make sure I have a consensus. Because any As one site I. could be wrong. Mm -hmm. So I check with EDU sites, I'll check with, um, there's a good botanical garden site, the Missouri Botanical Garden site is a very good site. Which is one that I go to. And it pops yeah. up pretty mm -hmm. quick. And, and that's nothing I like, an easy, mm -hmm. Some of the websites are poorly designed. They're hard to find the information. <laughs> right. uh, so that's one thing that I like to look for. <clears throat> um, the other thing that I like to look for are professional organizations for, for example, information about tree pruning or, or, or roots. Um, a lot of times, like if you type in tree roots and foundations, you're mm. going to find a whole bunch of garden bloggers that are going to tell you, oh, those roots are going to bust your foundations. <laughs> right. But we want to go to those sites that have really studied tree roots. Mm -hmm. And so the Urban Forestry Association, um, the Arboriculture Associations, any kind of professional association is really trying to get good information out there mm -hmm. to make sure that their information is reliable and trustworthy so that you hire their members. So I, I look for those. <clears throat> Also, if it's not about a particular group of plants, these large, well-founded plant societies. Okay. You know, the Magnolia Society, yeah. the American Conifer Society, there's a fern society right wow. here in Memphis, the mm -hmm. Hydrangea, Mid-South Hydrangea Society. It's big. 400, mm -hmm. 500 yeah, members. it's big. So, you know, you and I like to talk about replicated studies. Right. We're supposed to repeat studies several times to make sure that this plant <clears throat> does behave well in all these different mm -hmm. settings and over a series of different years. Well, imagine if you got four or five hundred members <laughs> reporting in on this particular hydrangea or conifer or magnolia. It's as good as a replicated oh, yes study. It is. And they're not trying to sell you anything. They want you to succeed with that magnolia. They want you to enjoy the plants mm -hmm. that they enjoy. So I certainly do trust that that information. Okay. Yeah, the dot edus, you know, is pretty much what I go by, and mm -hmm. and I and I look several states, you know. Yes. Uh, the land grant institutions, yes. I'm looking at all of their information. Very, very yeah. much so, and especially if we're talking about plant trials and evaluations, uh -huh. I look for those states that have similar climate, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Georgia, Arkansas, Mississippi, uh, Kentucky, Virginia. Mm -hmm. I look at all those and see, yeah, oh, hey, this plant's done well for everybody over a wide range of sites. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about this. What about Facebook? Because, you know, everybody's mm -hmm. on Facebook now, yeah. and they're putting garden information on Facebook. So. 
What do you well, think? I'm not a fan of just anybody's uh, information. Somebody okay. can put, oh, a, even just identify a plant. They know what it is. They act like they're an expert. A lot of times they're wrong. <laughs> uh, but then a lot of these sites have a lot of very informed members and a few specifics. One that I really love and use a lot is the Tennessee Naturalist Facebook okay. page. And they'll know plants in the wild and insects and moths, mm -hmm. frogs, mushrooms, you name it. So I love that site because usually I'll have like park rangers or different oh, informed neat. biologists who will come on and tell me. Also, the Soil Plant Pest oh, yes. Facebook page is that, I awesome. I doubt is good. Absolutely awesome. And of course, they're posting pictures of current diseases mm -hmm. and insect issues. So a lot of times I'll look at that and go, hey, that's what somebody just brought in today. So it keeps me very up to date. Not to mention that it also is going to give me recommendations. Exactly right. That's one Facebook page I go to every day. Yes, it is fantastic. Every day. It is a really fantastic. People who despise Facebook and think <laughs> it's all about, you know, videos of cats or uh, what you had for breakfast that morning. <laughs> I don't use it for that, and right, I use yeah. it for things that I'm interested in, uh, plants, uh, insects, even dog rescue groups. So right. A lot of times we'll network on the Facebook pages. Uh, the, if you're doing a plant identification, say, oh, in good, good. Tennessee, yeah. then the Tennessee Naturalist Facebook page or Plant Ident's, maybe a local Facebook page, there's Tennessee birds, mm -hmm. all kinds of things like that. But you can be in Hawaii <laughs> and take a picture of a plant and probably post it to one of the more international plant identification mm -hmm. pages and get somebody that knows that plant. It's just amazing. You could be somebody, an expert from India or China. Hmm. It's just awesome how all these people can network and just a little snapshot of a plant within a minute, you're told all about it. Yeah, so that's good. People who decide they don't like Facebook, they're just not right. using it right. Right. I mean, it's, it, you know, it has a good purpose. Absolutely. You know, if you can do things like that, for sure. Absolutely. Because, uh, you know, of course, we do that a lot. You know, just put pictures on there just to see if somebody can identify them. I know I do it, you know, quite often. So. Yes. Yeah. And not only that, um, also a few good industry magazines. I okay. like American Nurseryman because people like Mike Durr will oh. often write for that. <clears throat> but some of the little garden magazines that are written often by people, and I'm not saying amateur in a derogatory way, I'm just saying that often they have not necessarily done the scientific research mm -hmm. behind the article. So look at those with a little bit of a caution. Okay. All right. Appreciate that good information. That works. Good. Thank you. So late winter is really the idea of time to do a lot of pruning because um, your wounds can heal quicker. Uh, but I like to do a little bit of pruning during the uh, December for winter interest for my greenery. And so just a little bit about how to do that. Uh, this is Fitzer juniper. There's all sorts of evergreens you can use. Uh, Arizona cypress, gray owl juniper, um, foster holly's great to cut on. So save some of that from spring and summer till Christmas time and cut on it and use it in your container. So just a little bit about pruning. You always want to go back to, their, to the, the main trunk when pruning. So don't trim it off like this, leaving a stub. Go all the way to the trunk and prune it off and then it's much more attractive in the landscape. Also when something like this juniper, reach way down in the canopy. Don't shear it off up at the top like the landscapers tend to do unfortunately with head shears. Uh, go down and selectively prune into the canopy and then it doesn't look like you've got a sheared plant. All right, here's our Q&A session. Mr. Tom, you help us out, all right? Okay, okay. So here's our first viewer email. I saw your show about tomato hornworms. It happened to me too. I have never seen so many. They ate all the green off my tomato plants, which they will do. Even the tomatoes. Yes, which they will do. Mm -hmm. Will tomato worms infect the dirt where they were? And this is from Bobby in Crump, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So, here, we'll start with you. What do you think about that? Will they infect the dirt where they were? Were. You define infect. Yeah, you know? right, So, right. yeah, um, they do pupate in the soil. Mm -hmm. So, I guess we could call it infection. I don't know how you would treat them as pupate in the soil. See, I don't either. So, no. Not you know, in the soil. No. Mm -mm. But, so, so, yes, they're down there. They're down there. They're in the soil is where they mm -hmm. pupate. But, yeah, I don't know how you would treat for them down mm -hmm. in the soil. Well, I read that uh, one of the best things to do in a situation like that is just to till up the soil mm -hmm. and by where, where the, the plants were, because that's where they're going to be congregated. Right. And uh, it's most of the uh, information I looked at said it gets about 90% of them. Mm. But I'm also a firm believer in prevention. You know, the old expression, an ounce of prevention worth mm -hmm. a pound of cure. Mm -hmm. So using a product like BT, which kills them when they're very in the small stage, 
then you broke the life cycle. Mm -hmm. And uh, you do that for like two years in a row, and, and uh, I haven't seen hornworm in my vegetables in years. So treat the foliage before you see the damage, but they do have to eat some of they it. Eat it before that'll kill them. But mm -hmm. you try to, get, uh, hopefully you get them when they're really tiny because yes. the eggs are laid underneath the leaves mm -hmm. on the bottom side of it. Right. So if you can get them where they're still in the infant stage, there's going to be very little damage. Yeah. Awesome. All right, well, there you have it, Mr. Bobby. We appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's our next uh, viewer email with a picture. Will this ivy be harmful to this tree? Do we need to cut it off? And as you can see there on the screen, it's pretty high up in the tree. Yep. So what do you think about that? It's got to go. Uh oh, it's got mm -hmm. to go. It's got to go. Ah. English ivy, uh. not only will it eventually overwhelm the canopy and prevent the tree from photosynthesizing, because, mm -hmm. of course, the leaves are the source of energy for that tree, it makes that tree much more susceptible to wind throw. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which I've heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I saw that live and in person on a little highway where I live. There was a willow a weeping willow covered with ivy, and it looked so cool. Cousin it, big things yeah, just coming it. out of the ivy. Uh, I'm going to stop and get a picture of that as a joke slide one day. Wind blew it down oh, wow. before okay. I got stopped and got the picture. So, yeah. And when you cut it, you're going to see that the ivy, you can't get all the ivy out sure. probably that's up that high. It's going to take years for it to eventually drop right. out and go away. But cut it down at a reasonable base and don't let it get back up there again. All right, Miss Rebecca, so you have to cut it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I would advise cutting it too. I know some folks will say that you can use as one of those, you know, herbicides to get it down, but mm -hmm. I'm going to nervous. spray that, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, around your tree. What yeah. I studied also, it's yeah. a, uh, you know, cut it and kind of leave it and let it die. Mm -hmm. And rather than trying pulling off and messing up the bark and so forth, yeah. and let it just shrivel up on its own. Yeah, so it has to come down, Miss Rebecca, mm -hmm. all right? Here's our next viewer email. When is the best time to plant tulip bulbs? And this is from Carol. Not our Carol, but from another Carol. So mm -hmm. when is the best time to plant tulip bulbs? <laughs> now or any minute okay. now. Oh, any minute now. Because <laughs> it's been so warm, I've been afraid. <laughs> if you planted them in October, they might have gone ahead and started to sprout. Wow. So as soon as it begins to get cold, um, I hope people realize that tulips are usually not perennial here. Because mm -hmm. mm, um, I That's just recently that. had a call from somebody that spent uh, oh. money about put in 10,000 tulips around the big church and thought that wow. they were supposed to come back and I was like night mm -mm. yeah another good indication too wow. is when the nighttime temp nighttime temperatures are between 40 and 50 degrees mm -hmm. that's a good time to plant tulips yeah. uh, of course, you don't want to do it when the ground's frozen. <laughs> no. I don't want to be out there when the ground is frozen. Right. No. I also you get several weeks of winter chilling. A lot of people mm. get in touch with me in January, December, and say, I forgot to plant my bulbs. Is mm -hmm. it too late? And I tell them, usually not. Mm -hmm. You usually got plenty of chilling hours left. Go ahead and put them in the, in the ground. Okay. So they might come out a little bit later, but they're still going to come out. Uh, quickly, so if you put in the bulbs in the ground, do you have to do any prep? Well, uh, people like to put a little bit of bone meal okay. and all that kind of stuff, which I've heard is a lot of times myth. That's really hmm. not that much difference. If you've got good soil, probably not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Remember the planting depth when people talk about right, three point. times the depth of the bulb? The bulb is one of those thirds. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one count the thirds. bulb as the bottom third and then two thirds more, that's the top of your soil. Oh, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the bulb counts. Okay. Yes. All right. Good deal. All right. Carol, hope that helps you out. All right. Here's our next viewer email. Should I fertilize my shrubs and Japanese maples now in November? And we actually kind of... Uh, we yeah, talked about it's that. A little, it's a little late. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a, I finally was convinced that fall fertilization is a good idea. But this is too late because you're looking for that narrow window. You don't want to fertilize so early that it stimulates growth and right. frost gets the new growth. But if you do it while the tree is still actively growing, it'll store more mm -hmm. carbohydrates in the stem and root tissues, which helps with next spring green up sure. and growth. But this is a little late. I don't think we're going to benefit at all from fertilizing this time of year. I don't think so. Anything you want to add to that, Mr. Tyler? Notice that uh, I wouldn't do it this, this time of year here yeah, because late. in nature the tree wants to go dormant mm -hmm. and I don't want anything to interfere with its normal rotation of life. So mm -hmm. I would not fertilize. I would fertilize in the early spring before the it starts sprouting. Mm -hmm. uh, but now I kind of like to see it dormant. Okay. Okay. I don't uh, like picking the leaves, by the way. Okay. <laughs> so if you go to fertilize your, your shrubs and your Japanese maples, what's a good fertilizer for that, though? 
Uh, just you, a little nitrogen. Like? We this usually nitrogen. put in more P and K when we don't need it. When we don't need it. We don't okay. need it. We usually have plenty of P and K in our soils, of course, soil tests, yes. and you soil would know tests. for sure. Right. But just a light, you know, 12 by 5, and I always err on the side of caution. Less is better. Less is better. Mm -hmm. All right, Ms. Carol, Mr. Tom, we're out of time. Yeah. Okay. Right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Want to find out more about something we talked about today? Go to familyplotgarden.com. We have links to expert publications on everything we talked about today and everything we have talked about all year. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.